Hello to everybody, uh, wherever you're joining us from, and I uh, hope you're well. I hope your family and community are doing well. Um, tonight we have the fourth class of uh, this course on uh, Compass of Zen. And uh, before I get into the new material, I want to answer some questions that uh, the moderator has collected from the first three classes that we uh, never got to. So uh, I'll read them one by one, read one and answer one, and go through them. Uh, this is from uh, Ji Yo. Uh, some Zen teachers say that understanding and intellect is not helpful and discourage students from studying. So is it important to study Buddhism in Zen? Uh, you want to balance study and practice. It's like you can uh, read about swimming, but you got to get in the pool and then you can learn to swim. Of course, you might figure it out if somebody just throws you in, but uh, having some instruction along the way uh, is very, very helpful. Uh, if you do too much intellectual study, then you're actually going to uh, hinder uh, perceiving your experience clearly. Uh, Zen master Sung San, when he was first teaching in America, told all the students, don't read. But we had him actually there giving short five-minute talks uh, every morning and every night. Uh, he used very natural English expressions. And years later, I realized he was giving us the basic teachings from the sutras uh, in this very simple, natural uh, way. So we didn't really need to read because we had somebody so clear who was sort of giving us the pieces, the intellectual pieces that would help us uh, experience things clearly and then begin to digest them. So uh, find a balance. Uh, Korean Buddhism has taken the sutra schools and the different Zen traditions from China and kind of gathered them all together into one big school uh, through the 1700 years that uh, Buddhism's been in Korea. They have repeatedly brought it all together. But they say there's the primacy of experience, which means practice. So we don't exclude it, uh, study at all. Um, you want to find a good balance uh, in it. Second question, uh, Sergey uh, Manapta, sorry, pronounced your name wrong probably. How to understand the real condition behind the impulse to act? Is it true, just do it, or is it motivated by desire, anger, or ignorance? I, uh, I used to think about that a lot when I was, uh, the first couple of years I was practicing. Is this my true self, or is this my desire mind? Uh, that is called checking. So the first problem to eliminate is your checking mind. Uh, so use uh, the various practices, bowing, sitting, chanting, to cut off your checking mind. That's, uh, that's very important. Then if you're still not sure whether your behavior is, is uh, you know, going to really uh, benefit people, if it's true, just do it, or if it's desire, anger, ignorance, then keep the precepts follow the precepts. So, but first problem is that checking mind. So take away that checking mind. Gerardo uh, Maza, boy, long time. I think last time we met or were in touch with each other was uh, 1988. Uh, anyway, great to see your name popping up here. Uh, when talking about karma, it seems it's a concept that helps us to explain things. We could look at others' timeline, their process. We could explain their process in this way. I personally experience understanding certain of my own experiences as karma, but also seeing it as a very subjective perception of things. Like, is it a subjective perception of things? I guess that's what you're asking there. Uh, if you're thinking, it's subjective. Uh, if you're not thinking, if you've cut off your thinking, it's not subjective or objective. It's clear. Give you a, a very brief example for me. I was working, I probably mentioned this before, in a shipyard 
for uh, a year or so when I was work, um, uh, when I met Sung San Sinim. And uh, I was building a nuclear submarine after having spent years protesting against the Vietnam War. So all my friends that I grew up with were in graduate school kind of staying away from me, like, what are you doing? And I had lots of thinking, is this a good thing or, or not? Uh, then sometime during that year, I met Zen Master Sung San and I started practicing. And uh, after six weeks, I had done three three-day retreats and I was bowing uh, and sitting every morning and sitting in the evening. And one day after a three-day retreat, I was at work, working actually in the nuclear reactor room and in my mind, chanting quantum bosa, quantum bosa, quantum bosa. And then suddenly it became really clear, uh, I'm doing something bad and I'm not happy. I'm doing some of the words that came to my mind is I'm doing something horrible and I'm not happy and I quit. So I didn't really need to think, you know, too much about it after I started practicing. For me, within six weeks, it became clear by itself. So uh, it's not helpful to check. You know? So cut off your checking mind. It, yeah, you may make mistake in the process, but cause and effect will become clear. You'll learn. <laughs> if you keep thinking about it, you probably never will learn. So uh, don't worry about subjective, objective. Uh, cut off your opposites thinking. And over time, things become very clear. You don't even have to question it, is my experience. You, you won't question it. Number four, Mel Rani. While I practice impermanence and non-self, I sometimes suffer a sense of futility. How can I keep myself from falling into skepticism? Don't practice impermanence and non-self. <laughs> okay, practice uh, uh, waking, bathing, uh, dressing, eating, talking with family or friends, driving, working, practice your daily life, okay? If and pay attention. If you do that and pay attention, you will see impermanence and non-self by itself. You'll see it the way the world functions. You'll see when you hold on to I, you get suffering. You'll see when you want something to be permanent, everything becomes a mess. So don't practice impermanence and non -self. That's like trying to practice sunlight. How do you practice sunlight? Go outside, it's sunny, okay? If you're paying attention, you can see. So uh, don't practice those things. That's the best way to uh, avoid feeling uh, fut futile. <laughs> From the second section, uh, Hobbes and Sané ask, what can you do when you try to just do it but get stuck? Just stuck. <laughs> that is just do it. You're just stuck. Also, stuck is very important. Stuck mind can get to enlightenment. So nothing wrong with stuck mind. Just do it. <laughs> Max Andrew Huntag. The dog goes woof woof. Is that all? Do we need to further need to perceive dog's function? I sure hope you do. <laughs> because there's many kinds of woof woof. One woof woof, it means back off. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Come any closer, I'm going to bite you. Another wolf wolf might mean, hello, you don't need to think about it. Make one or two mistakes and you'll figure it out on your own, okay? So don't, that's all thinking. Oh, okay, a dog goes wolf wolf, but also, well, it lifts its leg when it pees. And how can I pretend to be, how can I become one with the dog, wag my tail? Don't make complicated. Make your mind very simple. Then eh, things become clear. Also, Actions, thoughts, and speech that create problems, it becomes clear after a while. You know what Einstein said insanity is? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So if you just see what you're doing and you're not getting the result you want, stop doing it. 
Okay? You don't need to think a lot. You need to pay attention. Soon you'll know what kind of woof woof the dog, what, what, what's on the dog's mind. And when you don't, you'll learn. Uh, Two Stream Zen asks, uh, Zen Master, last time you mentioned about your experience of a painful nose job and understanding practice is practice, pain is pain. Usually we come to practice because we want to quickly see the cessation, the end of suffering. But practice makes the mind clearer and pain is more clear. That's sort of a combination of a statement and a question because it also ends with a question. Body pain is natural. Bodhidharma said, all beings, all sentient beings that have a body will have a uh, uh, suffering. Mind suffering is a choice. So don't be surprised if your body hurts. That is natural. That is bodies, what bodies do, you know. Mind suffering is the problem. That comes from our thinking. You know, uh, somebody doesn't want to die, doesn't want to die, doesn't want to die, but they're going to die. So that's, they don't want to, that's okay, but at some point, don't hold it. Then you're more free. So, uh, you, very important to differentiate between body pain and suffering. Mind suffering, emotional suffering. Suffering always comes from an idea. Pain, body pain comes from having a body. But guess what? Even if you get rid of your body, it's not going to work. <laughs> so don't throw your body away. Just uh, uh, find your direction and then even pain can uh, be something that you use to benefit. Benefit people. Benefit yourself and others. Okay? And uh, don't worry about, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, one, one of our guys many years ago became a monk and uh, he quit. <laughs> He wasn't in Korea, he was in the West and didn't have much training, but somehow he became a monk and he quit like a week later. And his comment was uh, he was worried that he wouldn't be able to eat chocolate, which was very bizarre uh, thinking. But I remember one of the teachers, a lay, one of the very strong practicing lay teachers said to him, you know, I eat uh, chocolate less often than I did before I was practicing, but I really enjoy it when I eat it. So uh, don't, yeah, the sensations maybe become more clear. Uh, uh, it's only a problem if you have like and dislike mine and your direction's not clear. Youngin Ho, I am connecting from Toronto. I practice with Providence Zen Center. My question is related to your story that I told, I guess, in the second section, ses second class about a guy who lived on the third floor who was upset because you and your group were making uh, construction noises late at night. Did you and your group help him because he was upset about the noise? If so, how did you, or you and your group help him? We worked more quietly at night. Uh, that's the truth. Uh, third, last week, uh, Lev Rosin from Russia. So if Hinayana is a bicycle, what is it thinking about compassion and helping others? It's thinking. Uh, it's similar to thinking about water when you're thirsty. Drink. So there's no need to think about compassion. See clear, hear clear, help clear. That's all. Chanan. There's much suffering in this world, especially now with the pandemic and political conflict. I sometimes feel that there is too much suffering to bear, that if I open up and try to be compassionate and see others suffering, it will overwhelm me. How can I open myself to suffer others suffering and create compassion without it overtaking me? In the absence of conceptual distinctions, how do we understand the truth apart from direct experience? 
It seems that a thousand people will have a thousand different direct experiences of truth. How do we know which is correct or which to follow and which is reliable? All that is thinking. This kind of thinking cannot help you. Throw it away. What do you see now? What do I see? The camera is black. The wall behind it is white. Okay. What do you hear now? Just start with that and stay at that point. Don't think about other people's suffering. Just live your life moment to moment. It will appear when it appears in your situation. If you're in Nepal, you know, going to a Buddhist retreat, and just like a few years ago, there's a huge earthquake, and the buildings around you fall down, uh, do your best to help. If you're not one of the injured, just help. And of course, you'll be deeply affected probably by seeing people who are dead or people who are trapped. You know, if you read the police and they come upon some, you know, multiple murder scene or something, many of them say, it's the hardest thing I ever dealt with. But they're not sitting at home, hopefully, thinking about those situations. If it's overwhelming when you're in the situation, get help. Maybe the person next to you can, can deal with it and they can help you do, deal with it. Don't go outside of your situation so much. Yeah, understand the basics. You know, everything's impermanent. Everything has suffering from time to time and quite often. Originally, there's no I. That's what we're doing in this class. We're talking about the basics. Then pay attention to your, what you're doing right now, where you are right now. They say in Zen, in Zen, attain one thing, attain everything. So what do you see now? What do you hear now? What must you do now? What can you do now? Get it? Right in this moment. Then as you begin to understand the nature of life, we would, you know, what we call that in terms of political action, I mentioned it last time when I was young, is think globally, act locally. Impermanence, suffering, non-self, that's a all beings. What is this? Where am I right this moment? Then help. Maybe help means uh, don't cross if the light's red. Don't drive if you're drunk. That's already saving all beings from suffering. So don't, don't have your mind go out into the whole universe. Uh, it's not going to help you. Don't ignore, but return your attention to right now. Where are you? You can learn everything from that. The other parts is just thinking. Okay, so that, that kind of approach, what do I see now? What do I hear now? What can I do now? That'll lead to wisdom and compassion by itself. Okay, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, I hope uh, the answers are helpful. Uh, today, I want to continue with uh, part two of Mahayana Buddhism. It's so funny to think about part two. I mean, this is an enormous, uh, potentially enormous topic. Uh, although when our teacher was asked, what is the meaning of the Diamond Sutra, he said, uh, outside it's raining. <laughs> so uh, today the three main uh, topics are uh, the, uh, the Buddhist and Mahayana theory of mind only, uh, karma, and the six paramitas, which are the practices that uh, Mahayana Buddhism teaches. What is the theory of mind only? Well, I said Mahayana Buddhism in very simple words means going from nothing to something. Theravada and Hinayana Buddhism begins with a desire, anger, ignorance, a form and feelings and uh, all this suffering. And through practice and uh, a clear view, uh, attain nirvana, complete emptiness and freedom from 
of all suffering. Mahayana begins with emptiness. Originally, all things are empty. Six patriarch, originally nothing. But the something here it is, you know, here we. So, what is this? What do we do with it? Okay. So the theory of mind only talks about what is this? And the first thing is what Buddha called the 18 realms. Everybody has eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and a mind, thinking, thinking apparatus. Okay, that's called the six roots. That's the roots of our experience. Without any of those things, no experience. And we're talking about we're talking, so it's about what we're experiencing. Second is, uh, there's something we could say, although this is not correct exactly, something outside. Uh, we see color, okay? Objects have, th this outside world has color. It has sound, it has smell, it has, uh, you know, something you can taste and feel and think about something. So color, sound, smell, taste, feeling, and object of thinking, object of consciousness. Those are called the six dusts. You know, this world is just a big world of dusts. So in the human world, the dusts are color. Uh, you know, your eyes, if you really learn to pay attention, really, really, very moment to moment, so clear. Don't see objects. We see colors, patches of colors and dark and light and so forth. And our brain puts it together. Oh, it's a camera, it's a computer, it's a person, it's their face, okay? Sound, etc., etc. So six roots, six dusts. Some people are born, they have eyes, but they don't work. That means their eye consciousness isn't functioning, okay? So eyes have an eye consciousness, ears have an ear consciousness, nose has a nose consciousness, tongue has a tongue consciousness, body has body consciousness, and mind has a mind consciousness. So those are called the six consciousnesses. When an eye and color and eye consciousness come together, we can say black purple, you know, white. Any of those are missing, the seeing doesn't happen. Same thing with the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind. So that's called the 18 realms. If you remember the Heart Sutra, which we talked about two weeks ago, Buddha takes away all of those 18 realms. No eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no color, no sound, no smell, no taste, no touch, no object of mind, no eye consciousness, and so forth until no uh, consciousness of mind. So he's saying, no, 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 no. He's showing you the original emptiness of things. So these are the something. The, 18 realms in which we exist. Now, I want to talk particularly about one of them, the realm of consciousness, okay? Uh, Buddha described eight consciousnesses. I, I mentioned them, eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness, this simple thinking consciousness, okay? Those six consciousnesses, when, when they're spoken about in Buddhism, are always joined together. So we just say the six consciousness. Babies, we are born, if we have all six, they're all functioning right at birth. So when you're born, this uh, uh, six consciousness is already there and functioning. And it's like your will, your will consciousness. Okay, now babies just respond. They just respond to stuff. Something's in their mouth. They either keep it, smile, spit it out. They're not thinking, I like it, I don't like it. It's just do it. They're just do, 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 do. Okay, 
Around one or two years old, seventh consciousness appears. This is called discriminating consciousness. I think we talked about this before. You know, like I said, a baby will just spit something out. But around one or two, many times, also this thought appears, I don't like it. And then even if you give it to them and they recognize it, they won't even take it if they don't like it or if they see something they want. That's when attachment appears, when this uh, uh, seventh consciousness starts to appear. It's our emotional mind. So I said uh, before, you, you give a baby maybe a pen and they're playing with it. You take it away and they cry, 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 and then you give them, you know, you give them this and they soon forget about the pen. They're not attached to it. Now they're happy and they're playing with this, but maybe at one year old or two years old, you take away the pen and give them this. They don't want this. They already have a discriminating mind of like and dislike, and they'll throw it away and scream for the original thing. So that's from seventh consciousness. Then around, and it gets stronger as experiences, as a, as a person has more experiences. Around three to four, eighth consciousness appears. This is often called storehouse consciousness. It carries memories. Uh, most people, sometimes maybe after class, sit down in a chair, get comfortable, and maybe you've done this before. Try to read, what's my earliest memory of life? My earliest memory. Usually in the beginning, nobody can think of anything before three or four years old, sometimes not even that young, because this memory consciousness isn't really functioning yet. But sometimes if you really let your mind go, if you're practicing in your daily life, pay attention, you can sometimes have some memory from before that. I had one, not that early, but it was about 18 months and I checked it out with my mom and it was right, you know. And of course it involved her, which is why it would make a, a more strong impression on a young young kid than maybe something else. But some, some people, I think the, the uh, uh, I don't know what you call it, a male ballerina, I forget, you know, this traditional dancer, I can't think of it right now, but Baryshnikov, he, he came to the United States from the Soviet Union, and uh, I saw in an article where he, they asked many people about their earliest memories, and he asked his four-year-old son, and the four-year-old son described something that sounded like childbirth, <laughs> so who knows, you know? But in general, this storehouse consciousness, which is carrying impressions from previous lives, starts to function around three or four. So somebody like Mozart, who has very strong uh, music karma, suddenly at three or four, he hears something, he can play it. That's his uh, storehouse consciousness starting to function again. And one thing about the eighth consciousness is uh, they say it never loses anything. There's all these impressions in there. It's like a very, very high class computer. And if we are holding things in it and don't clean it, or at least learn to, like a mirror, not hold things, it will carry it into our next life and be re partly responsible for making our next life. So uh, the consciousness, the nature of our consciousness is very important. Buddha said, human beings are basically a pile, like a pile of stones. And one of those stones is form, and one is feeling, and one is perceptions, and one is impulses, and one is consciousness. And so consciousness is very important. And in this situation, uh, and in this talk, you know, Buddha breaks down the nature of our consciousness. And I'll explain shortly how that can be very helpful. Uh, in the Compass of Zen, in this chapter, Sung San Sanim talks about a friend of his who was blind. But when somebody came to the front door, even if he wasn't expecting the person, soon he knew who it was. 
And Sansinim asked him, how do you do that? And the guy pointed to his nose. If he smelled somebody, he never forgot. So what can happen when somebody's blind or deaf or something is the energy that normally goes into that experience concentrates and goes into other parts. And people, like blind people, can be much more aware hearing or smelling, things like that, than most people. Which also means if you practice, you can, uh, your, your energy can get focused and eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind can be very perceptive, you know, very, very clear, function very clearly. So there's a quote in this book, it's very interesting. It's uh, as Sung San Sinim in this says, if you have no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, and no mind, then your mind light is shining everywhere. But this is not to encourage you to get rid of your body. <laughs> That's not going to help. You have to attain not allowing I to appear when seeing or hearing or smelling or tasting or touching or thinking, okay? If we, and we can talk about this under the Zen sections, if we're very attentive and we notice how subtly I appears and eliminate it, that name is no eyes, okay? Getting rid of this I or killing yourself will not help. That will not take it away. You'll come back with more problems. So uh, one of the, uh, Buddha said there's eight main sufferings, and one of them, the last one actually, is imbalance of the five skandhas, form, feelings, perceptions, impulses, or consciousness. Some people very attached to their form. Some people, uh, feeling is too strong. Some people, I know some people, they're like, I can perceive you, I can perceive your karma, you know, but too strong. So not have wisdom attached to I perceive. Even if they're right, it doesn't necessarily help anybody. So wisdom is far more important than any of these particular abilities. Um, also, it's possible to have an imbalance of the consciousness. For example, some people, their six consciousness is very strong. So everything becomes decided by their physical experiences. Many, many people, the emotional consciousness is too strong. So their likes and dislikes control uh, their lives. Uh, many people also, something from the eighth consciousness is too strong. I had one friend who, uh, he, he said uh, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, he was a Jewish background. Every time he went to Germany, it's like World War II would play through his head. Even when he's with people who are friendly. But there was some very strong thing in his consciousness. But practicing, 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 we went there once years later. I asked him, you doing okay? He said, yeah, no problem. So he cleaned it out. So it wasn't affecting his experiences. Many of the conflicts around the world, they are coming from holding before life conflicts in our eighth consciousness. So one thing that can happen is the sixth, seventh, and eighth, one of them is too strong. They're not balanced. In fact, they can separate. When we sleep, our sixth consciousness is laying in bed. It's asleep, nothing's happening. But your seventh and eighth consciousness are functioning. Then they take things from your experiences of your sixth consciousness, add it to their things, and make a dream. And when we wake up, you know, you wander around, you throw water in your face, you get coffee, and then slowly your body, your sixth consciousness, seven and eight, come back together. That's one reason we do 108 bows first thing in the morning. Very quickly bring six, seven, and eight back together. And a lot of practicing is bring them all together. Bring them all together. Bring it all to one point and make it clear. Then they function together just reflecting. 
just reflecting. That's what we call true nature. So uh, also, some people, uh, you know, uh, you can really see this in America, in a big city like New York City. You're walking down the street and there's some guy walking along talking to himself. He's even having an argument like he's talking to somebody else. That is, a, we say, broken consciousness. Seven and eight is so strong and has been functioning separately from six so long, they've become crazy. If you keep following that separated mind, keep indulging in that kind of a thinking, checking, holding, angry, separate from what is your daily life situation, then one day, this is very hard to bring back together. You're, you're what people call crazy. Also, I'm, I know in Asia, I don't know what to make of this, but they say when if the if this consciousness is separate, the seventh can separate from the eighth, the sixth from the seventh and eighth. If they separate, it's possible for some consciousness that doesn't have a body to come in. Then they say somebody's possessed. How do you deal with that? One way is in practicing, you bring all of them back together to one point. Chanting really helps do that because you're using your body, you're using sound, and this uh, you take the energy from your emotion or from your thinking and you just use it all on one point. Quantum boso, quantum boso, quantum boso, quantum. And slowly, slowly it all comes together and finally six, seven, and eight uh, is just quantum boso, quantum boso, quantum boso. Then one more step if you see here, here, uh, see clearly, hear clearly, etc. That's a clear mind, and everything's functioning very well. So that's uh, one way we use um, uh, practice when uh, consciousness is what one part's too strong or uh, they are kind of broken. Uh, bring it all back together to one point just now. Then this just now clear. Then okay. If you do that again, 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 your center becomes strong. Then no problem. Uh, very important. Our body is not I. It's just the coming together of the four elements, air, earth, fire, water, according to the karma that we've created. Karma uh, comes from our thinking. So when we maintain a type of thinking over and over and over again, it becomes our karma. We create a kind of mind habit energy by what we choose to follow, follow, follow. Okay? The name for that is karma. Habit, action, mind habit mind energy okay our karma makes our body our body makes our karma so unless you break in there and make something clear it just goes around 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 name is samsara when this body falls apart when it, the body uh, dies the the elements just sort of fall apart and separate the seventh and eighth consciousness don't die. They continue as some kind of habit energy. And it's this mind habit energy that makes the next body. So learning to control your karma, which also means learning to deal with and control your thinking is very important. If we practice, practice return to our original nature, then you can control your karma, you can use your karma. If not, when we die, our karma will take us someplace. If you behave a lot like an animal, it will take you in an animal body. If you do, if you're always filled with desire, 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 don't think of others, you become what they call hungry ghosts. Or if you do really bad action, you, become some creature, a hell realm creature. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. But the important part is 
we create this mind habit, this mind energy habit, which becomes our karma. And that is what creates our, our body, our next body. Okay? So, it's important to learn how to deal with and control your karma. If you practice and continually make effort, return to my true nature and live my everyday life moment to moment, you can control your karma. You can begin to control your karma. And then going out of this life into something else isn't a problem. So uh, next step in this uh, discussion of what, what is this something we experience is uh, uh, in, in <coughs> Mahayana Buddhism, they talk about four kinds of birth. Okay, I'm going to check with this for, for one thing. I mean, it's pretty simple. Uh, humans, elephants, dogs, cats, mammals uh, are reborn through womb, through the womb. Okay, women, uh, uh, female uh, creatures, uh, mammals have a womb. Then the creature grows inside and comes out, and uh, there's a, a, a new birth. Um, birds, reptiles, many, uh, uh, many fish, uh, they're born through, reborn through eggs. The Buddha said four ways in which uh, birth which is like a door back into this world. Bacteria, amoebas, creatures like that, they're born from moisture. The interaction of a creature with moisture creates the birth. And um, spirits uh, reappear through transformations. So four doors into this world. Womb, eggs, moisture, and transformation. Um, that's just to give you a sense of how sentient beings appear in this world. Next and important is a, a human experience of what Buddha called the six realms, uh, particularly Tibetan Buddhism. It's the, in their tankas, often the six realms are portrayed. Very briefly, uh, the six realms are heaven, asura, human, animal, hungry ghosts, and hell. Heaven is like kind of gods, creatures that always are experiencing uh, pleasantness. Okay? Asura is kind of gods, but they're the ones who are angry and jealous a lot. Uh, when we look often to the right, facing Buddha to the right, not always to the right, but often to the right, there's a picture of the Asura, what's called Buddha's army. And it's usually these fighting guys and fighting, fighting, uh, you know, Bolsonims or something that are powerful, but they follow Buddha. Okay, that's Asura. That's the Asura realm. I mean, not all Asuras follow Buddha, but that's the Asura realm. I always thought of people, you know, like Americans who start wars and stuff. They're kind of Asura. You know, these political people that get power never were a soldier, but they like to start wars. That's kind of a, a, a Sura type. Then there's the human realm, uh, which that's us. Um, the, human, the, the human realm is the most important. And one reason is the human realm is not so pleasurable or so much suffering that it's not possible to raise a question. We don't have too much pleasure or too much suffering. So we can, what is this? You know, most of us, sometime around eight, nine, ten, start thinking about like, what, what is this? You know? And we forget it quickly because we get involved in the daily uh, desires and, and social interactions and things. But most people, at some point, get this question. That's very unusual. Uh, Sores don't think about that so much. They're sort of power and, and angry and jealous. And uh, gods are just like, hey, everything's cool. You know, this is really wonderful in the Buddhist teaching. But humans can raise this question and really look back at myself and wonder, what is this? What am I? 
Animals is the next realm. Animals are wonderful because they're simple, but they're very narrow. And seems like very rarely can they get a question because they're very strongly controlled by their body and their body desires. Um, uh, human and animal are called the realms of desire because we definitely have physical form and there's things we, we want. But uh, people who really do lots of stupid action often are reborn animals. That's called uh, the realm of stupidity. The animals aren't so bad, but if you're a human and you become an animal, unless you really chose it for a bodhisattva reason, uh, you're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Hungry ghost is someone desire, desire, desire. You know, I often wonder about like rich people. Maybe you know, if there's some rich people. It's cool. I'm rich, you know, and help a little bit and have a nice life. But some people never enough, never enough, never enough, never enough. Food or sex or, or money. Money is a big one. Fame. It's never enough. Fame. You know, uh, they become hungry ghost. Hungry Ghost is pictured as uh, some uh, uh, being that has a very, very thin neck and big fat belly. So they're always hungry, never can be satisfied. And they can't swallow even one morsel of food. So at the end of a, a meal during retreat, uh, tea goes around, we wash our bowls with tea and drink it. Any of the, the, the <coughs> leftover particles of uh, food, we, we drink, okay? So we finish everything. Tea comes around, we do it again. <clears throat> and then, uh, well, maybe tea was, I already said, water. We have water, we do it again with the water. But we save some water that's perfectly clean. And at the end of the meal, everybody has eaten everything they took, even the crumbs. And a common bowl goes around and we offer everybody makes an offering of clear water and then that bowl is taken and uh, in korea the hungry ghosts live outside the kitchen in an area surrounded by little rocks i, I don't know how they get there but uh, that's where they live in america they live inside the sink so you pour it in the sink so you know different countries the hungry ghosts have different places to live but you always make this offering of pure water. If there's any crumbs in there, it'll get stuck in their throat and they'll suffer. Uh, so it, they're, they're so hungry all the time, endlessly, that they can't raise this question, you know, what is this? And the hell realm, that's for people who do really lots of bad action, make many suffering for other creatures, and they are reborn in a situation that is constant suffering. And the suffering is so continuous that they also can't raise a question. So uh, the uh, realm of the human is considered the most important because we can raise a question and through the question, attain enlightenment, understand our true nature and our uh, correct uh, way, and help others. You know, compassion, correct love, wisdom appear naturally. Um, these are not just places, but they're kind of, they're created by our mind. So you know, even in one, one moment, even in, in, in a short time, you can go up and down between all those realms. You know, you come home, okay, you're a human being. And then, ooh, I, I want to hug my girlfriend, you know, and she's not around. And then you do some texting and she's not answering. And then there's a little message, I have to work late. And then you start thinking, I don't, is she really working? And, you know, you get jealous and then you call the office and nobody answers and then you get angry and then, you know, you get stronger desire and then you think she's having an affair and you're just suffering, suffering. And then she comes home and she, you know, is happy to see you and she's obviously, uh, you know, wants to hug you and, and uh, she loves you and you're in heaven. Well, you just visited all six of them in, you know, the time that it took her to 
drive home from work. So have a happy day. <laughs> <laughs> If you want to get out of the six realms completely, then you must keep a don't know mind 100%. But if you get enlightenment, you choose where you go. Also, you can use any realm for the Bodhisattva way. So, uh, you know, I feel like I mentioned this in another class. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, one time in France, uh, Sun Sanin, we didn't have a Zen center at that time, was giving a talk at a Tibetan center. And somebody uh, said to him, sir, you know, when you die, uh, where do you go? And Santini said, well, why are you asking? And he said, oh, I really like you. I, I want to follow you. And then Santini said, oh, when I die, uh, I will go to hell. Then the student is like, what? You know, it's like, I don't want to go to hell. Why are you going to hell? Then Santini said, if I don't go to hell, then who will save the beings who are in hell? I'll go to hell, make a Zen center, teach meditation. So then you're free. You go wherever you go, and you use it to help all beings. Make a Zen center and teach meditation. That is the six realms. Karma.